suppose the biggest difference is there wasn't space in 1966 for people who didn't belong to the mainstream tradition. Uh, 19, 2016 was utterly different in that the space was found for all of the different groups. Well, I suppose what 1916 means to me has changed with the passing years. I mean, if I begin starting off as a youngster and brought up in the then accepted version, there were heroes. It was the most important thing that had ever happened. I had pictures of them. I read everything I could about 1916. This was now in my early teens. Then I suppose when I came to college, I began to change. And what changed my attitude in large part, it was 1966 and uh, there was a presidential election on and I, I was very involved as a student in the presidential election and I began to realise that this election, this, the whole, the ceremonies were almost being staged, managed by Fianna Fáil, that the 1916 was owned by one party and it really it was part of Mr De Valera's re-election campaign and that I must say angered me greatly. I also, in a way, the ceremonies themselves, the sort of triumphalism and also looking at these groups of veterans with their hard-faced elderly men as I saw them, um, you know, grim men, uh, and if this was the inheritance it didn't impress somebody who was a student. Um, and so I began to lose any sort of the, the sort of interest or the enthusiasm. And at the same time, I was beginning to meet a lot of the survivors of the first government because in 1966, we in Young Fine Gael and UCD organised a series of seminars on how we afforded the Shelburne Hotel, I don't know, but we did. And people like General Mulcahy, Michael Hayes, Ernest Blythe, um, Paddy McGilligan, I, uh, I think David Nelligan, but I'm not sure. But many others of these came along to talk to us as students about their experiences in 1916 or their recollections of many of the people of 1916. So that maybe shaped my subsequent historical interest, uh, which tended to be more about the men of the first government and the first government and what they had done. And a lot of my research and so on really focused in on, on the, the post-independence period. Um, I could also say that, so 1916 faded, but I was deeply affected by the Troubles. Obviously I lived through all of the period I used to, I was very involved as a young politician with the SDLP and I campaigned with Seamus Mallon and John Hume uh, at by-elections and I suppose and attended their conferences and obviously I was appalled by what was happening and by the IRA and also by the IRA's claiming of 1916 and I had the, the usual for the time sense of great ambiguity about whether 1916 could be used to justify what was happening in Northern Ireland so there was a pretty big turn off uh, during for most of those years and really it was only with the uh, arrival in one sense of the decade of centenaries and the discussions and I became involved that I began to change my views somewhat. Now by this stage I would have been I think intellectually uh, a very sympathetic to the view that the Irish party had been airbrushed out of history, uh, that uh, a lot of what John Bruton was saying, although he wasn't saying it then, uh, that it did have, uh, at least uh, the, it did deserve to get a fair hearing and that one could take a view that maybe 1916 hadn't been necessary and we would have got something similar. So I was, that view was competing very much with me. But when I was asked to 
uh, chair the, the expert committee, then I, obviously I began to think a lot different. And I suppose some of the views maybe you'd ask me about began to maybe harden up during that period. Everything was different, really. I mean, there was a sense in 1966 that 1916 belonged to one section of the nationalist population and other people weren't welcome. And I was always struck, because I grew up in a small town where there were many veterans of the First World War, and I'd got to know these fellows growing up. They were fellows often standing on the street corner. They were unemployed. They had small pensions. And I got to know them and realised uh, just instinctively that they were not really part of the mainstream of life in Bagnallstown. And I had listened to a lot of them telling me about some of their memories uh, of, of that period. I, I also... Um, so I was very... I suppose the biggest difference is there wasn't space in 1966 for people who didn't belong to the mainstream tradition. Uh, 2016 was utterly different in that the space was found for all of the different groups. And I began to notice this for the first time when Martin Manser and myself were touring the country, as we did in the early stages, just holding public meetings and listening to people talk, getting their views on how the decade, and we were very careful to stress the decade of centenaries should be celebrated. And I think it was down in Thurlis one evening that it dawned on me that the public were way ahead of the politicians on this. And I remember in particular that evening, relatives of, of the great war veterans spoke. So did some people who belonged to the Constitutional Party tradition. And there were people there who would have been maybe hardline old IRA. But there was no antipathy and there was a mellowing. And there was also, there were also a lot of people there who were just curious as to what happened, uh, but they weren't coming with preconceived ideas. So we began to realize then that this was going to be different and maybe it wouldn't become a source of, of, of division that it could actually have a unifying effect. In the committee, we had a problem, a difficulty, engaging the interest of the, of the government in what we were trying to do. Um, they had many other, maybe more pressing problems in those years of 2011 and 12 and thereabouts, but just getting them interested and getting the public service civil service interested as well and we were also nervous that if there was a vacuum that this vacuum would almost certainly be filled by Sinn Féin and that the whole event would be hijacked. We weren't worried about it being hijacked by any of the main political parties but we had to keep it in mind that, that parties and there were some politicians who did feel that it could be an electoral advantage if the general election was in 2016. So that there were these sort of there was this sort of nervousness, and there was the nervousness, I suppose, especially that it would be exploited by people who would use it as a justification for violence. Yeah, there were a lot of misunderstandings maybe early on, and the biggest one maybe was, um, I mean, for example, both Eamon Gilmore and the Taoiseach, I think, not very helpfully. Uh, after the royal visit, began to talk about a royal presence in 1916. And this was an enormous source of distraction. Uh, it gave people a great stick to beat the commemorations with and to impugn all sorts of motives to those who were organising it. You know, and there was rarely an edition of Phoenix which didn't feature who fears to speak and would this be, you know, would, uh, in one sense, would 1916 be ignored completely? Would there be a sanitised version of what happened? And all sorts of motives were attributed. Likewise, the letters pages of the Irish Times uh, on Fublock, the Irish News and other places, these sorts of suspicions were there. So, in a way, the, there, there was a lot of suspicion. There were other groups who felt that who hadn't been welcome in the past and were 
bit tentative about whether I'm thinking of the ex-servicemen, I'm thinking about maybe the RIC and people like that, who weren't very sure of whether or not they would be able to fit in. Maybe they're not all very sure yet, but at least uh, that those suspicions eased quite a bit. So there was, there was a lot of explaining to do as well. And I suppose one of the biggest problems early on was that we had to persuade people of our bona fides as a committee, that we were not a mudguard for the government, we were independent of the government, uh, and we were not you know, lackeys of the government in any way, that we were independent. Now, ironically, the presence of the committee, in my view, was greatly welcomed by the civil service and by the government, because it gave a framework within which they could operate, and it set down certain principles as to how the whole thing should operate. And as time went on, they found that a great safeguard was it gave them guidance, they knew what they had to do, where they had to go, and they had a committee whom they did begin to trust, I think, as they went along as to our motives and expertise, and they could come to us uh, for advice. So it, it did work. It has exceeded any expectations anybody could have had and in a number of ways. One was the sheer ceremonial itself. I think it was magnificent, and I haven't met anybody uh, who was there or who watched it, people overseas who watched it, who wasn't very proud of what happened and who didn't feel included in it, and it was part of them. And I think that you know, the government, the ceremony spoke for the, for the nation, I believe. So that was wonderful. I, I'm all, I was also enormously pleased by the involvement of local communities. And I attribute this largely to an initiative by the Minister, Heather Humphreys, that we had thought, Martin Mansour, myself, and the committee, that we could build the local communications, or local ceremonies, rather, around the um, local history groups around the country. Now, we discovered very quickly that while they were well-intentioned, they didn't have the resources, they didn't have the structures, you know, they, they didn't have the money, and they were not in any way coordinated. So I would regard the fact that Minister Humphreys brought together all of the county managers, got some funds for them, had John Concannon inspire them with his vision of what could be done, and they bought into it in a big way, and I've been at many of these ceremonies. And I think it was very good for the local authorities as well, and they realised this, that it gave them a great link into their own communities on something that was different, that wasn't just about you know roads or bins or things like this, this was something. And I think that that has been one of the most extraordinary aspects of it. I also think that um, the universities have really risen to the challenge and I'm not saying this because of what's here but I think that the UCD uh, effort, the, what UCD has achieved has been absolutely outstanding and really stand the test of time. I believe a very good legacy. And the other universities as well and schools, the programmes the schools were very good but there has been a great deal of very good of scholarship, of drama, film, documentaries, a whole range, uh, new books, all of that. Um, and local books and so on, which, which will leave a lasting legacy. So I think in that sense, there, there's a real legacy culturally and so on. And I, I think also the, the work of the contribution of the Board of Works has been extraordinary. And this predated um, the foundation of our committee. This was all uh, plans. They were looking for money, waiting for money, but those plans were there and they were very well thought out, the various um, legacy monuments and buildings and so on that are uh, part of this uh, of, of, of the uh, celebrations as well. So all of that was good. There were many other very good things, but um, I suppose it also, I think, gave us a sense of ourselves that the events were not divisive. People took pride and, and they, as I said earlier, they were able to accommodate differences. And this was utterly new. And this, to me, maybe is the most 
gratifying aspect of it all.